Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, very good evening. Hello, everyone. Yeah. We have uh, our, you know, discussion about fantastic new book, Energize, with uh, our friend Simon Alexander Ong. He, he did some uh, uh, podcast interviews, so he will be a little bit, you know, late, but he's going to join us. If you can, we, we see our friend, you know, Mika from Finland. Good evening from Finland. Good evening to Finland. You know, if everything goes well, we should have today bridge like New York. Lisa, New York. I'm in Prague and Simon, Simon is in London. So three most important cities in the world, you know, should be represented. So if you can be so kind, because we are broadcasting on LinkedIn and on YouTube, if you can put in the, in the comments that you can see us and hear us, and I will also uh, put my LinkedIn on on the phone so I can, you know, check if everything goes, you know, well. Perfect. Because last time we had some problem with, you know, our LinkedIn connection. Uh, exactly. It, it, and, and Jan, we had a few people let us know that even in the replay, the video wasn't there. So I'm hoping this time, I'm hoping I didn't break it because uh, of my you know email. Lisa, I put link to YouTube. YouTube was perfect. YouTube Today, works. Okay. It should be everything should be okay. Also on the LinkedIn, it, it looks like you good. know it's it's working you know properly. Oh, David, looks David, it's it's working perfect. And, and hey, I just Simon, I, Simon I just is wanted, there already. Oh, so let's get in. in. All right. Hi, Simon. <laughs> How are you? Simon, welcome. Jan, Lisa, I am doing fantastic. Thank you very much. Hope you are both having a beautiful week so far. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's perfect. In New York, April, spring has finally come. All of the flowers are blooming. Everybody's ready for Easter. So everybody's in a really great mood. I wore this color orange because my nails were all the rage last week, Simon. <laughs> Nobody could stop talking about the nails. So I thought I'd really bring the color here today because we're talking about energy and energizing. And I think some colors and some fun can also bring a little energy to the conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> totally. I'll just... Because I, I have a, my, you know, a logo of my book there and I'll make sure uh, that, you know, it will, it will go out, but I don't know how to do it. You know? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a positive either logo, you know, there. Uh, <laughs> while you're working on that, Jan, maybe I can introduce everyone absolutely, uh, absolutely. to our good friend Simon, who's here with us today. So um, I'm, I'm sure many of you have already heard of Simon. He's a fantastic coach, but I want to tell you a little bit more about him and why he's on here today. So I'm going to read his bio first so you get the full sense. Um, Simon Alexander Ong is a personal development entrepreneur, coach, and public speaker, and his clients are from all walks of life, but they share one trait. What do you think that is? They all believe that the greatest investment you can make is in yourself. Sound familiar? Sounds like something a coach would want to do, right? And his work has seen him invited onto Sky News, BBC Radio London, Barclays UK featured him in a nationwide campaign. And guess what? We're not the only ones who want to have him talking. He's been featured in HuffPost, Forbes, Virgin, Guardian, and he's working with companies like Salesforce, Microsoft. We know a thing or two about Microsoft and Unilever. And we're so excited to have Simon on first and foremost, because he shares all of our same feelings about that we really need to do physical, mental, emotional, spiritual energy work, that we don't manage our time, we manage our energy. But the question is, how do we energize, right? So Simon has a new book that's coming out very soon next week in fact and we're going to put the link into linkedin uh here in just a moment and it's called energize right very easy to remember and it's a great starter for what we want to create here today so that was a lot of me talking simon anything you want to share before we jump in and start asking you some questions absolutely well, first of all, Lisa, I think you did a fantastic job of that introduction. So thank you so much for the very kind words. Uh, and I'm very excited to discuss uh, the new book, as you as you shared just now, Energize, uh, which I put together over the last two years, uh, which in hindsight has been one of the greatest challenges I've faced, because not only was I writing this book, uh, the world was in lockdown and I became a parent for the first time. So balancing wow. Ooh, what's going one, two, on in three. my personal life. With also writing a book uh, was a little bit of a roller coaster ride in the last couple of years. <laughs> so you needed to take your own advice for how to stay energized because a newborn totally. will really take your energy. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Good. I'm adding your link here. Here is the here is the here is a funny story. 
me and Simon, we knew each other uh, since like clubhouse era. We were there like every day. <laughs> But we are seeing face to face each other for the first time. We were always like communicating, yeah. <laughs> we never saw each other. So this is also. But anyway, Simon, it would be good if you can talk a little bit about the book, about the structure of the book, and what inspired you to uh, write the book. And then we have a lot of you know questions and discussion, and hopefully our audience will also ask us some questions. Definitely, definitely. So first of all, I'll start with uh, the structure of the book. Uh, so I, I broke the book down into four parts, and it very much mirrored uh, it mirrored my own journey, uh, my own life journey from right. working in the corporate world to breaking out of that to running my own business uh, and developing that into where it is today. And so the first part of the book is called Awaken Your Power. Right. I, how do we begin to discover the uh, energy that we have within us to accomplish some of our biggest goals? Right. The second part of the book uh, talks to how we can rewire our energetic state uh, so that we can have the mindset that is going to help us achieve those steps towards our goals and visions. The third part of the book is one that I think is, uh, is a challenge for many leaders and those who have high ambition, which is protecting your personal energy. Yeah. When you've because got a lot of energy. Of leaders are not able to say no, right? Exactly. 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 So we may have a, a lot of energy, but how do we protect it for the things that matter the most? And the final part of the book I called Supercharge. And it's, well, how do we supercharge our legacy uh, once we've got these foundations in place so that we are able to live a life of meaning? because I'm a believer that our value as a human is determined by how much more we have given to the world than we have taken from it. And so I wanted to speak into that. And on the question of how did the idea come about, Jan, you know, if I look back at my journey, there was a pivotal moment in my second job. Now, mm -hmm. just to give context uh, as, yeah. to the, as to the career I, I began in, I started in the middle of 2007 in the financial services industry at what was Probably the worst possible time to start in that <laughs> industry. <laughs> 2008, right? 2008. Absolutely. Come along. Yeah. yeah, this this was a year before the crisis. And just to make things a little interesting, the first company that I signed on to as a graduate was Lehman Brothers. Of course it which, was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great start. It's a great start. In the beginning of my career, absolutely. So, so it was a very volatile start to my career. I, I was looking for a job within just 14 months of starting my first job and that led me to to work in the hedge fund industry so my second job was was with, was within the hedge fund industry now on the outside it sounds glamorous you, you know simon is working in a hedge fund uh he's trading equities he's trading the stock market but i was only a junior in this company and right. if you wanted glamour you had to be one of the senior managers you had to be the person at the top the portfolio yeah. manager was was where the the glamour was really at and so I was working long hours. I was working punishing hours. I would be often in the office around six or seven in the morning. Very often because we had a New York office, I was physically in the London office until around 10 or 11 at night. And there was one Christmas where I went to a client event straight after finishing work. And I remember texting my girlfriend at the time saying that I will be getting the last train back. So I should be seeing you around one or two o'clock in the morning. Okay. Now, that was before I went downstairs into the club. And of course, my network gets cut off. I hand in my jacket. I hand in my belongings to the cloakroom. And then the alcohol, because it's free flowing, it's just on tap. <laughs> the night just takes hold. And before I know it, I'm stumbling into a taxi and I'm heading back home early morning. And my girlfriend, as you can imagine, is worried sick it's because now, here she yeah. is expecting me to come home after the last train. She cannot get hold of me because I can't respond because my phone was off because it lost signal. Uh, and I arrive home, collapse in the bathtub, just didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I was like in a complete mess. And the day after, when I was a little bit, a little bit more sober, we, we sort of had a heart to heart conversation and she brought up some very harsh truths. You know, she was telling me that, Simon, since you left Lehman, since the crisis happened, this job is just killing you. It is killing you physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if if this job is going to help you move forward. I mean, I don't see you doing well in this job if right. this is what you're like right now. And she was right. 
you, you know, I didn't, I didn't like to be told that. I, I, I think that I, I wasn't comfortable sharing what was going on. I mean, you probably relate, Jan, you know, when I was young as a boy and uh, when, when things happen to you, you're often told back then in society, man up, move on, yeah. suck it up, you know, bounce back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so I was very uncomfortable sharing what was really going on emotionally uh, inside of me uh, with, with my girlfriend. And I, I really was grateful that she gave me the space to openly share what I was actually going through. And I was I was lost at the time because I had this ambition of developing my career in the financial industry. But because of the right. crisis, the job I thought I was going to do well in didn't exist anymore. Uh, the company I am wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And I was just aimless. You know, my weekends were spent binge watching TV series. I used alcohol and, and partying uh, as things to escape the reality of where my life really was. Mm -hmm. And so where a lot of the idea for the book comes from is the fact that when I started to prioritize my health, then okay. things started to really change. Okay. And so what I did is within just a couple of days of that incident, I handed in my resignation. And I decided yeah. to still look for a job within finance because I couldn't get any other job. My background was in finance, but I yeah. deliberately started to look for a job in finance that was much more than nine to five and less stressful. So it would give me the time to start prioritizing my health again. Mm -hmm. And that was when, for me, my life started to change for the better. Right. And it gave me the time to also think about what I really wanted to do. And that's it, Simon. I can't tell you how many times I ask clients, what do you like to do for fun? What do you enjoy? And they're like, I, uh, well, let's see, I work and I have family obligations and, um, you know, I do yoga and I'm like, but do you do yoga because you like it or because it de-stresses you mm. from all the stress you have at work? Oh, okay. Yes. What do you do for fun? What do you like? Mm. People don't know. Mm. The, we've arranged our lives completely backwards, yeah. forgetting to prioritize. I'm mm. that, that would be a question for you, because I, I went, as you know, I was depressed when I was 50 years mm. old, very difficult depression. I shared it at a clubhouse at, at that time. But why do you think people feel guilty if they do something they like just for, you know, enjoyment? <laughs> That's right? it. Because we really feel like guilty. It, it looks like we are born to suffer. And this <laughs> in your life, you know, right? So why do you, why do you think we have this notion of hey, I do something I should not do it that long, you know, right? Totally, and, and I think many uh, many people have probably gone through uh, that experience, Jan, that, that you were sharing. Is that we have grown up focusing on doing things that we believe will make us happy and successful, but are not actually the things that do because we're right. going against who we are. For me, I grew up with the mistaken belief that success would be defined by my job title. So okay. be a banker, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be an accountant. Now, what I quickly came to realize through my own experience that I shared just now, but also in my own transformation uh, from where I was to where I am now, is that many of us are exhausted, not because we are doing too much, but because we're doing too little of the things that bring us joy, that make us feel happy, and because we are running someone else's race. And we're measuring our definition of success and yeah, progress yeah. against metrics defined by other people. And I think when we when we do that, we are in a race that we can never win. We can never win that race. And it is why if you've read the book, uh, The Top Regrets of the Dying by Bronnie Ware, you yes. will note that the number one regret that she wrote down was that I wish I lived a life more true to myself than a life lived for others. And that is why. That is why you may have heard of the saying that the longest journey we humans make are the inches from our heads to our hearts. That is the longest journey that we as humans make. Because as you say, we tend to go with our head when we make these decisions. According to my family, this will make me successful. Society tells me this will be successful. So I think with my head and I go for that. But actually, when we do that, we ignore our heart. But when we start to listen to our heart, we begin to understand that while it may not always lead us to where we want to be, it will always lead us to where we need to be. Simon, it's so, so true. Because if, if you, I, when I started my career, I did the same thing. I really wanted to go the corporate path. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to, you know, and my mind, I would say, if you look at my Clifton Strengths Finder, strategy is not high on my list, right? I'm much more the intuitive feeler type. But I don't, I didn't want this skill set. 
I fought it tooth and nail. I took extra project management classes. I wanted to, I got an MBA. Mm. I wanted to do what I thought success was. And until mm. I learned to just listen in and say, you weren't born that way, Lisa, you got to tap into <laughs> what you do have. That's when I could really say, okay, I'm meant to be a coach and I could accelerate and I could fly. And it is exactly that where people have to give up. What do we think mm. we need to be? And what? Can, how can we just use what are our strengths? What are our natural energizers? And how do we mm. go from there, right? And then you wake up every day wanting to go to your work. <laughs> totally, totally. You know, for it me, is, like the is. questions... Go on, Jan. Wait, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, finish. I just yeah. The, the questions that, that really helped me to understand that was reflecting on, well, what, what did success mean to me? And then what sort of impact did I want to have in the world? And I think once we have sat down and answered these questions, which often are not easy because we rarely have sat down and done this. You, you know, I think that many of us have done it for our company or our bosses or our managers. You know, we've put together a project uh, of how we're going to run this uh, to the end, how we're going to deliver it for the client, or we've put together a project for uh, how we're going to uh, win this next deal. But when was the last time you sat down and put together a plan for your life? And I think many of us haven't done that. So when we do that and we come up with the answers to questions such as what success means to us, what sort of impact we want to have, the greatest challenge is to then design our life around those answers. Yes. Here is the, here is the question, Simon. You have like two of us. Lisa is American. I'm like Czech <laughs> origin, but I'm brainwashed by Americans. Like, <laughs> there's, there's something called epigenetics. You have like Czech team, but if Americans are shaping your life, like in my case, you know, you are a lot of... So we've switched on the American. You know, I, 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 if we talk about energize, right? If we talk about the energy. I did very well with my physical energy, but I underestimated like renewing my mental energy. That's why I ended mm. up, you know, when I was 50 years old in the mental hospital. Uh, I think Lisa figured out earlier that that's necessary to do. Hopefully she will avoid mental hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. So Fingers you never crossed. know, right? Like... Now, now here, is the, here is the question. Here is the question. I said like 15 years ago that, you know, Chinese, Vietnamese, Indian managers, all of those, you know, guys with, with like traditional cultures in like meditation, yoga, tai mm. chi, they are handling stress much better than the managers from the Western Hemisphere, right? And you have this unique position, you have like Chinese blood while mm. living in London. So I would, I would like to ask you, because it seems to me that Asian people, they, they, they are like, oh, we need to work as much as, you know, hard as a people in the West. And we started to meditate, right? So do you think that those cultures are getting like closer or what's going, what's going on there? You know, if we talk about the energy. Definitely. Definitely. I, I mean, I think these cultures are coming together more than ever before. I mean, you just have to look at uh, Silicon Valley, the startup culture over in, in the West side of America exactly. and talk and talk about this coming together. I mean, there are now chief wellness officers, chief people officers, chief heart officers. And I think they're starting to understand uh, the importance of addressing our mental and emotional well-being. I mean, even uh, if you look at some of the academic research, uh, Google conducted a study called Project Oxygen back in 2008, mm -hmm. which was to understand what made great leaders. Now, what they discovered was that just because you are a great salesperson or you are a great engineer or uh, right. technical analysis it doesn't make you a great leader yeah. what makes you a great leader is the fact that you are a good coach and i think related to that is understanding yourself you, you know you can't lead others until you're powerfully leading yourself first exactly. and i think this is the role of of awareness yan and, and awareness is something that has been part of asian uh heritage if you go back in history and and the uh, proponents of meditation of mindfulness and i think a lot of this is now coming over to the west to understand the importance of slowing down and when you look at how busy the world is how noisy the world is today slowing down is becoming increasingly an important superpower yeah. uh, you know there's a there's an interview I reference in the book, and, and I'm sure both of you uh, may have watched in the past before, but there's an interview hosted by Charlie Rose, uh, where he has the opportunity to interview both Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And at one point of this interview, he turns to, to Bill Gates and he, he asks Bill, what has been some of the lessons that you have taken from your friendship with Warren over the years that you have known one another? 
Mm -hmm. And the first lesson he shared was to never pass down wealth to his children. Uh, and so he set up the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, the second lesson he said uh, was, I remember when I first looked at Warren's diary. And at that moment when Bill says it, Warren takes out a black book and pen. And he jokes with the interviewer, very, very technologically advanced right here. Uh, but, but in fact, it's very old school. It's just a, a notepad and pen. And Bill says to Charlie, when I first looked into Warren's diary, I saw so much blank space. And then I compared it to my diary. And I saw that my diary was back to back meetings. It was meetings with shareholders, meetings with colleagues, social calendar was full. And I realized as soon as I saw Warren's diary, that it was no way to live. It was no way to enjoy my life. And then that became one of the catalysts for Bill Gates now employing his famous reading weeks. So Bill would deliberately take time away from the everyday business to retreat Absolutely. into a cabin to read, to learn, and to write. You know, when Bill was traveling with me, there was like one security guy, and he was always carrying the like the bag with the real books. You know, right? He <laughs> he still enjoys. He he's using Kindle, but he still enjoys to read. You know, from the mm. real books because he's doing a lot of notes in those books. Mm. Right. So this is absolutely look. Another another question. You mentioned the leadership, right? Mm. Because our energy, our emotions are contagious. If you are like as a leader, you are pissed mm. off. Then your team very soon is also pissed off, or they are scared. Yeah. This is even worse. Okay. Yeah. If you are like, hey, you are brave, you are positive, then the chances are that those emotions, because of the what we call mirror neurons, those you know emotions are you know contagious. So mm. I I wanted to ask you what is what is the ideal chief energy officer like a leader who is having energy but is able also to like radiate the energy to the to the mm. team. Right. Yeah, what we need to do to be like that. You said one thing is self-awareness. Absolutely. Mm. You want to understand others. You That's need great. to understand yourself to compare mm. where we are the same, where we are similar, where we are different. But how about how about the energy? What we need to do as a leaders to have energy mm. enough and to be able, you know, to, to basically radiate the energy. Definitely. Well, I think it's a great question because when you are in a position of leadership, you are essentially the thermostat of the company. Yeah. So as you said, Jan, you know, when you are low on energy, that will radiate into everybody else in the organization. When you are positive, of course, that will radiate as well. And so yeah. if we are to be that positively charged leader, then what we must be aware of is how we are managing our own energy. And so that goes back to something that Lisa shared at the beginning, uh, our physical, our mental, our emotional and our spiritual. How are we when we reflect on those particular areas? And if we are low on any of those areas, how do we address it? And it also comes down to understanding how we manage our diaries. You know, when we talk about productivity, we tend to default to focusing on time management. And now don't get me wrong, time management is important when it comes to productivity, but it is missing a crucial piece of the puzzle. Because if you focus exclusively on time management, you are assuming that your energy is constant throughout the whole day. So if you start putting in your calendar, four o'clock, I'm going to go to the gym, six o'clock, I'm going to do this project, you forget that your energy goes through cycles. So unless you're working with your energy, you're going to be working against it. And so when you better understand how to work with your energy, that means that when you do show up in the office, when you show up for your employees, your staff and your colleagues, you show up in a very different way. The energy that you emit and you radiate will be infinitely different. That's right. Here's the big question I have, Simon, because here's the trend that I noticed. And I loved this in your book as well. You talked about how we, we wear busyness as a badge of honor. Mm. Right. So when people ask, how are you busy? Right. That's the default. It's not even good anymore or fine. It's busy. Why are we stuck in this trap of busyness? And then if I can also add this, this was one of my favorite things you had in the book. You have a story with a client where you asked for Emma to create Emma's perfect system for always running late to meetings and feeling exhausted, even on weeks that are not super busy. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that and share it with the audience? Because I think they're going to enjoy it as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. So, so going to the first question about the uh, the business, I, I think that as a society, we are so uh, 
we're, we're so used to thinking that in order to be productive, in order to be making progress, we have to be doing something. Right. So that if I'm not doing something, I am not productive. I am not making progress. But actually guilt, what you realize, yeah. it's, it's a guilt. Yeah, it's the guilt that if I'm doing something, then, well, I'm, I'm not productive. Uh, then I should do go back and do something. Right. But what we forget is that actually when we slow down, when we are able to build in moments to disconnect as much as we schedule in moments to do work and go to social events and have a holiday, when we schedule in moments intentionally to disconnect, that is actually how we access our creative energy. Yes. You know, I don't know if these anecdotes are true, but if you go back in history, some of the greatest insights were not discovered by somebody sitting hours on end in front of their desk looking at a screen. Right. Isaac Newton and gravity, apple under a tree. Archimedes, yes. bathtub, yes. Eureka. Yes. Eureka. Thomas Edison, fishing with no bait. So nobody, not even the Absolutely. fish would disturb Absolutely. him. And so even though I don't know these anecdotes are true or not, I think there is so much wisdom in them in that in order to make the most meaningful progress forward, you've got to have a rhythm between periods of deep work and periods of intentional rest. And when you can get that rhythm right, and we will all have different rhythms. We all work differently, we all function differently, but once you understand your rhythm, that's when you experience greater moments of flow. And, uh, and just in response to the second question about Emma's perfect system. So I like to use that as a bit of a joke, Lisa. So when somebody tells me that this is going on in my life and I don't know how to change it, I will have a bit of fun and just come to them as if what they're doing now is exactly what I am seeking. So I yeah. want to know your perfect system for always being busy and never getting the most important things done. Tell me how you do that. Because the process of having a bit of fun with them in this exercise is to really raise their awareness of what is going wrong in their life. And so when they list all those items out, it awakens their mind to, wow, this is, this is really why I'm always busy. This is really why I'm not enjoying life at the moment and really why I'm always stressed. And so the purpose of that, even though it's a bit of fun, it's just really to raise their awareness about what is really going on. Yeah, you 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 said one very true thing that you know uh, if we do something which we really enjoy, we are in the flow, mm. and if we are in the flow, we are not busy. Our brain is mm. on the frequency uh, eight to twelve hertz, which is called alpha. You know your yeah. your brain is very stable. You are like here and now in the present moment. <laughs> you are concentrated. That's why your brain can. Your brain is not reacting to each and every situation for mm. the first time. Your brain is like comparing what's going on with what is sitting in your long-term memory. And for that, mm. you need to have like 100% concentration. Otherwise, yeah. you are not reflecting reality, right? So uh, how, how much, because you obviously those like Eastern philosophies, like, you know, Buddhism and all, all other stuff. How much you personally, Simon, are inspired by people like, you know, Buddha, right? Because Buddha mm. was psychologists they created yeah. you know religious <laughs> afterward they created all marketing around it mm. afterward <laughs> psychologists who wanted to get rid of the suffering that was it that was the main you know reason what that's why mm. he did what he did you know right how much did you uh, you know uh inspired uh, were you inspired by those guys I am I am very much inspired by by Eastern traditions. Uh, you, you know, when you read the book, you will notice I referenced uh, a number of Zen uh, okay. stories and parables, yeah. uh, and there's a reason for that because a lot of those stories, a lot of those uh, there's a lot of wisdom. Yeah, exactly. A lot of those teachings have have uh, affected me in a very positive way. I mean, just to give an example, I remember on my very first trip to Japan in in 2017. Uh, I, I went from Tokyo to Kyoto. And in Kyoto, if you've ever been to Kyoto, yeah. it is full of Zen temples. There was a lot of Zen temples in Kyoto. And you can visit mm -hmm. them. And just by visiting them, you feel calmer when, when you set foot in any of these temples. Yeah. And I remember uh, going to one of these temples. And there was uh, a 45-minute experience in, in which you as a tourist could experience meditation uh, in right. one of these guided classes. And I remember there was... There, there was a section on the wall that was inscribed in English. So me as a tourist, I could read it because I, I, I can't read Japanese. And at the top of this inscription, it read, be attached to no outcome and open to everything. 
yeah. be attached to no outcome and open to everything. And I thought it was just so beautiful. And, and just within one sentence, there was so much wisdom. You know, first of all, if we break that down, be attached to no outcome. The reason many people are happy are, are unhappy is because they're attaching yeah, their well-being it. and their exactly. emotional feelings to an outcome. You know, that's when even this the, happens, that's even, the, that's even in the sport. If you are so yeah. much concentrated on the results, you are usually mm. not long-term successful. If you love the way, if you mm. love performance, you know, and you mm. try to be the better version of yourself every day, yeah. it's kind of the Definitely. growth mindset from Carol Dweck, mm. you know, from the book mindset. Definitely. Definitely. You say. Yeah. And, and, and that is very much that because by detaching ourselves from the outcome, what happens is that we can actually live more in the present. And yeah. then the second part of that statement, which says be open to everything, that simply means be open to learn. Be open to adapt because the world is constantly changing. And unless we are open to opportunities, conversations, connections, uh, then we're just going to stay stuck. And, you know, when I look at my journey, Jan and Lisa, I never planned to write a book two years ago, two, two and a half years ago. Oh, sure. That wasn't that was not my outcome. You know, I was not attacked for the outcome of writing a book. I never even planned to write a book. But simply by by being open, and as Jan beautifully said, by just trying to be better than who I was yesterday, suddenly I had people wanting to have a conversation saying, Simon, uh, we would love to have a talk about writing a book. And these opportunities came about not by deliberately trying to pursue them, but really just by focusing on being better than who I was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, because you said per perfectly, uh, you know, there are two things for optimal performance. Be in the present moment, which means like be detached from the outcome. Because once you are tied with the outcome, with the with the result, you are not anymore in the present moment. Okay. When I when I met for the first time uh, Rafael Nadal, he mm. told me, hey, I really became a real player when I was able to forget about the last ball. Whether I'm winning mm. the ball or losing, it doesn't matter. That ball is gone. It's captured mm. on the scoreboard. <laughs> I need to concentrate on this current book. You know what I mean, right? In the current yes. book. And, yes. and the other thing, open to everything, okay? Whatever is happening in your life, it's past, basically. Mm. Even if it's very traumatic, doesn't matter. You just need to accept what happened mm. and move on. It's called post-traumatic growth. You are you mm. are emerging as a hero because you are like, hey, this is, as you rightly said, this is what mm. I can learn from it. Let's move on. If you mm. are still in the past, you know, right, you're suffering mm. once, it happened, and ag again, all time you remember, <laughs> oh, as you suffer again, so it's called yeah, traumatic yeah. stress disorder, mm. you know, right? Yeah. So mm. why I think those guys were really very smart and very wise while, you know, saying that, you know, many thousand years ago, right? Yeah. And this is the thing, yeah, and, and, and Simon, I mean, when we're talking about our energy management, a lot of the um, we're, we're, a lot of the energy that gets lost is in the emotional stuff. And mm. it's in the, am I looking good? Do I look smart? Am I doing this right? Have I convinced everyone that mm. I'm not an imposter today? <laughs> right. And we're doing so much management of other people's expectations of us mm. that it drains our energy because instead of us coming from what's the message from within? Right. Simon has a clear message. And he mm. said, oh, shoot. OK, the path opened that I should take this message out in a book. Great. But he's still living the message from within. Mm. Instead of letting other people's expectations drive us, how do we let us drive from inside out? And I think that's really the key that most people haven't yet learned to make that switch. And that's where mm. energy is dying. <laughs> Definitely. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, when we think about our reality, one of the insights that I came to understand, Jan and Lisa, is that we live in the feeling of our thinking moment to moment to moment. Yes. You, you know, we like to think there is one reality, but there simply isn't. There is only customized reality. So, you know, the way you interpret an event may be different to the way I do and different to the way my partner does or my colleague or my friend. But if that's true, that means we have greater power over our reality than we give ourselves credit for. Because at any given moment, we can choose a different thought and thereby influence the choices and behaviors we make. Uh, and so I think that's a superpower we don't give ourselves enough credit for. Yeah, I agree. And Lisa mentioned one important thing, emotions. I think uh, stuff like Instagram, you know, Facebook, uh, it's mm. killing <laughs> authenticity <laughs> because <laughs> you know, people are putting them some pictures. They look much better than the reality, right? 
<laughs> then they are looking into the mirror. Oh, shit, I don't look that good. So they are pissed off. And they are pissing off all other people because they think, hey, it's them, really. They look so good, right? Yeah. So this is it. Why Why we do it? Because I think it's it's kind of the fear of other people's opinion. We are fearful mm. that other people would say, hey, she she or he does not look good. And we, we do it like that. And our predecessors, they, I think it is about your soul and about mm. your heart rather than about your look, you know, right? I mean... Uh, once, look, I'm, you know, 60, I mm. probably look a little bit, you know, younger. 60 to new 50, come on. <laughs> anyway, you know, I, I don't mm. care, to be honest, mm. I don't care. Because it's not about your look, it is really about how you feel about those emotions. And mm. unfortunately, we are spending so much energy with negative emotions. Mm. Like, anyway, mm. if we envy that people look better or they are like, you You work very hard and then they, they your best friend is like, I'm on Seychelles, you know, put the, some picture. And maybe they were there like half a year ago, right? They are not there anymore, but you are still pissed off like, oh, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I think if you really, as Simon rightly said, if you are on your own and you try to be on your way and be a better version of yourself, Stoics in old Greece, they mm. said, you cannot change other people or the situation. Mm. The only thing you can change or influence, it's you, basically. Mm. And if you go mm. like deeply inside of you, then you can manage quite well also your energies, obviously, your mm. emotions yes. and mental energy and, and so mm. on. So. Jan, can I just add here, sure. I actually love the emotions of envy and jealousy. Mm. Because most people think, oh, I'm not good enough or that. And they interpret it in a certain way. But Simon, like you said, we have the ability to decide how to interpret it. Whenever sure. I notice I'm feeling a jealousy or an envy, I'm like, ah, oh, that means I want something. This is giving me self-awareness, right? Mm. Oh, this person went to it the Maldives on vacation, which is right? Not, uh, which is not good news for your husband, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I won't go there. He's going to watch this whatever, later. Next <laughs> <laughs> But when I notice, like, oh, you know, they have, they're doing something I want to do. They got some promotion. I, I, then I say, great, and I take it to me. That that mm. means there's something there that I want. What can I do for myself to get mm. myself there? So I can use it to interpret. Aha! I have more self awareness of what I want, and now how do I go out and get that mm. for myself? So I turn it into a motivator, and an insight creator. Right. Mm. And then it's a yeah. great thing yeah. to know what's going on. It's, it, it's a drive. Yeah, definitely. That's, definitely. That's, that's, and that's a good view. Yeah. You, you know, just briefly on this, this topic of social media, I, I think for me, it comes down to our intention with it. Uh, because I think at the end of the day, social media, just like money, is, it, it's just a resource. It's a tool. And, uh, you, you know, just to show you what I mean by how we intend to use it. If you Absolutely. give if you give a knife to uh, a doctor or a surgeon, it will save a life. But if yeah. you give a knife to a murderer, it will take away a life. In the same way, when we use social media, there's two ways that we can use it. Either we use it to consume or to compare, which is unhealthy. It's an unhealthy habit to simply just consume and compare yourself to everything that's popping up on your newsfeed. Or... You can use social media as a platform to create, to yeah. add value, just in the land. same way we're doing right now. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. to learn from other people, to use it as an educational tool and a way to share your value with the world. Now, when you approach it in that way, it becomes an I amplifier agree. of your message. And so I think with these things, we have to, and it goes back to awareness again, we've got to be aware, how are we using social media? Is it having a negative impact on me or is it having a positive impact? And if it's negative, how can I change my relationship with it? So I'm using it as a platform to spread positivity and to learn from it rather than drain my energy and exhaust myself from all the mental uh, comparison and and just sort of trying to keep up, as you said, yeah, and trying to keep up with what everybody thinks I should be doing. Yeah, no, yeah I absolutely agree. Simon, this is a key part of your book as well. And I want to pause here and just say, if anybody has any questions, put exactly. them into the chat yeah. box because, you <laughs> know, take advantage while Simon's put here. Your questions in the, in the comments, absolutely. Um, but a key part of what you say about how to you know, manage your energy and gain energy is to consciously design your life. Instead mm. of letting things happen to you and be like passive within it, 
you be the active creator. So you said I'm conscious, mm -hmm. I'm intentional about how I use social media. What are some small ways that we can consciously begin to design our lives mm -hmm. to get more energy? One thing you already said, figure out your schedule based on your energy cycles, right? Mm -hmm. Don't just let meetings happen or don't just throw meetings on your calendar, actually decide where is my energy and my highest at night or in the morning and I can sort of create the schedule that's right for me. What other places can we be designing for energy? Sure. So I, I will share uh, two easy tips here. Uh, the first is, and it's, it's one that you probably already heard about, but I'm going to like focus and add it in a different angle. So it's about gratitude, except I'm going to add in the, the next two words, with it, which is gratitude with intention. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've got to a point in which at the end of every day, we just go, what are the three things we're grateful? We write it down, that's it. And it's become, I think, very superficial to the point we don't really feel the, the, the emotional um, yeah. sense of gratitude. We just tick the box, we wrote three things down, we move on. So when I mean uh, to express gratitude with intention, it is to deliberately take time to connect to the feeling of gratitude and so understanding the role it plays in our life and on our mood. So, for example, there's an exercise I share in the book, which is one of the most powerful exercises you can do to transform your energy immediately. And that is, first of all, think about one person that you can be truly grateful for. Next is to write down why you chose that person. What was it that they have done for you? How have they shaped into who you are? What would life be if they simply didn't exist in your life? And then the third part is the part that is with intention. The third part is when you pick up the phone, you call that person and you tell them exactly what you wrote down. This is gratitude with intention. You are sharing with them why you are grateful. And here's the beauty of this. Not only does the recipient benefit from you sharing that piece of gratitude, you also benefit. Because what happens in that moment is you connect to the fact that we are all one, that we are all connected on this planet. And as Pam Grout wrote in her book, Thank and Grow Rich, which is actually a play on the original book, Think and Grow Rich, okay. she wrote in that book, gratitude is the gateway drug to abundance. Because once you experience gratitude and express it with intent, what happens is that you begin to open your mind to opportunities that you were previously blind to. You know, gratitude turns a meal into a feast, a home into a palace, and a stranger into a friend, as many of us discovered when the world went into lockdown. I agree, because normally, if your brain is not trained, your amygdala, which is the emotional part of the brain, is five mm. to ten times faster than your logical yeah. part of the brain. Oh, yeah. So mm. if... 10 things are going very well that particular day. And one thing you didn't do well, your amygdala goes and going around that bad thing. You know, once you will start to do and gratitude with intention, I think mm. it's fantastic. You mm. will change it. You will like cool down your amygdala. You will, you will see, hey, my life is good. In fact, you know, you will change. Mm. Everything is about paradigm shift. One, you will mm. change the way you see yourself. Your life will totally, you know, change. Yeah, right. That, that's, Definitely. That, that's exactly, you know, true. Uh, there is a there is a one thing which is chapter one or part one. Mm. Focus on what matters the most. Okay. When I coach, for example, you know, top tennis players, I'm telling them, you know, you always need to ask question after each and every ball win question, which which is more or less what is important now because. Mm. You know, even if, if you are losing the previous ball, your amygdala tries, oh, I should not lose it now. <laughs> the other player is going, you know, well, whatever. You need to get back to the present moment mm. to ask this logical question. What is important mm. now? Because if you are like winning and it's like 40-0 and there is a one, you know, ball from the other person, you are it's like 40-15 still. So what is mm. important now to play, you know, well, to concentrate, mm. right? So uh, I would like to ask you more about this part on what you would recommend if there are some you know uh, exercises like what people can do uh, what they can help them what are really most important things in their life mm. well for me th th there's a great exercise uh, I did uh, in, mm. in the other part of my journey to, to help me understand what was most important and the thing is I, I still did this exercise again and again because as you said Jan what's important then is different to what is important now things change life changes and one of the things I did is I got a blank piece of paper 
and I got a stopwatch out and I put the stopwatch on 60 seconds. And okay. what I did is I wrote down everything that I wanted to do in my life. I see. Everything. Like in if I had no seconds. boundaries in 60 in seconds. 60. And, here's, and, and here's why. The reason I, you I think I yourself, know why, but tell them. Tell them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason you time yourself is to prevent overthinking. Exactly. Because exactly. if you had no time exactly. limit, you would be judging your thoughts. You'd exactly. be saying, well, actually, can I do that? Can I not do that? Is this possible? And you don't write anything down or you write something down that is heavily edited. So when you when you limit yourself to 60 seconds, what happens is you get the raw data. You get the raw data. The first thing that comes to your mind, it goes onto paper. Because yeah. often there is a reason why something has come up into your mind straight away. That is your soul or your heart speaking to you. There's a reason why you've had that vision or that idea comes to your mind. And so what you're doing in this 60 seconds is you're downloading all of the data from your mind of what makes you feel happy, what makes you feel alive. Yeah. And then the next step that I did when I did this exercise is looking at all of the things that I wrote down. I fast forwarded myself to the 85 year old version of me at the end of my life, looking at this list as if I had done none of them. I had not even followed through or started with anything on that list. And I started to circle the things that I would regret the most. What would I regret having not even started on that list? And for me, this, this begins to open up what is most important exactly because you, exactly. Shift, you shift your perspective it's not what do i think is important is what i'm going to transport myself in a moment to the yeah. 85 year old person at the end of my life and if i did nothing would i be happy and if not that tells you a lot you know if you feel a bit of guilt that you didn't get the opportunity to start this particular project or this particular task that you wanted to have done in your life then that tells you something that is your heart trying to give you a signal. Yeah. And Simon, if I can add here. So part of my thing and the people that I work with, I work with corporate uh, CEOs and stuff. But what I really love is these entrepreneurs who think really big. And mm -hmm. I'm sort of here to blow everyone's minds and expand even <laughs> further. Right. So in examples like that, when people list what's possible, and then you say, okay, here are my goals. Here's what I want to create. That's perfect. But what we forget is we're still within a limited frame mm -hmm. of mind of what we believe was possible. Maybe it just never occurred to us, or maybe we've self-edited. And then I say people, okay, take that 10 times bigger and that mm -hmm. even beyond, right? And what's that even more? Because what we think we want is still very limiting. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. And I, I recently uh, gave a commencement speech for an MBA mm. program, one of the top MBA programs in Europe at the University of St. Gallen. And I was writing it and it was all about breaking your boundaries and busting free. And I'm practicing it with my with my husband at home. And he's like, oh, man, you know, this is great. You're Harvard's next. And I'm like, ah, Harvard's not going to invite me. And he's like, didn't you just write a speech about not limiting yourself? And didn't you just limit yourself? And I'm like, oh, shit, everybody does this, right? <laughs> so uh, even I think having the list, getting focused, and then having someone who's going to be like, wait, why couldn't you do even more? And mm. why couldn't you do even more? And why couldn't you do even more just expands what's even possible so that not only would we feel satisfied at 85, mm. I want to be blown away. When I'm 85, I want to be like, holy how did I get, how did I do all of that? Right. That's sort of my goal. I know I'm a little crazy. I'm a little out there. But that's what I want people. I don't want people to be like, that was nice. That was good. I want them to be like, I did it. No, I, I agree. I agree with you. My, yeah. my kind of the motto is aim for the moon. Mm. Even if you miss the moon, you are still among the stars, you know, right? So mm. why, if I, if I work, for example, with athletes and they want to be among top 10 at the Olympic Games, that's not good material for me. Mm. I work only with the people who want to be at the podium. Not everybody will be there, but you mm. need to have this mindset. That's There's nice. no way, you know, you, 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 you need to have this kind of, the, you know, mindset. Otherwise, yeah. don't compete, you know, right? This is it. Uh, but what do you said about this, like, 60 seconds? This is interesting because Lisa <laughs> mentioned... Clifton Strengths Finder. And in fact, mm. I worked for like 22 years with, with Gallup and, and Jim Clifton, who is now, uh, his father created Strengths mm. Finder. He passed away 2004. 
Uh, but I work very closely with, with, you know, Jim. I even spoke at a, you know, summit last year. And Jim told me, I, I said, Jim, what is the reason why you have only 20 seconds for each and every question in the test? And he said <laughs> that basically you need to be very authentic, that it's the answer mm. sitting because the, the test is testing your preferences, your life preferences. Mm. Like, what, yeah. do you, what do you like in your life? Exactly as you said. So you, it is. it needs to go from your heart immediately mm. you know, there. So... I really, I really like it. It's, uh, it's kind of you know, and the, the piece is like <laughs> five years, you know, old. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely. And and Lisa and Jan, if I may add, sort of two thoughts sure. on one, what you were saying just now, Lisa, about uh, you know what you like about entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurs, right. uh, and also about this aiming high. You know, as you were both speaking, it reminded me of. Uh, one of the quotes from Sir Ken Robinson, uh, you know, one of the famous TED speakers, and he said, "Yeah, I, I, I like him. Unfortunately, yeah, he's, he's, he's amazing." The world. And, yeah, and good. yeah, so the, the the late Sir Ken Robinson, one of the things he said is that the problem isn't that we aim too high and we fail; it is that we aim too low and we succeed. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and it does make you think. It makes you think. And and just on the second point, which is about entrepreneurial skills, a lot of people ask me, "How do I?" How do I activate more of my creative energy? Because when you want to be innovative, when you want to be entrepreneurial, a lot of that involves thinking creatively. And one of the things I often tell them is that don't look at your competition. If you only look at your competition, you can only be as good as your competition. Exactly. So the challenge is to actually look beyond your field and into other fields in which people are accomplishing some incredible things. And then asking yourself, what of what he or she is doing that I can bring into what I do to be different, to be innovative, to be creative? Exactly. And you know, just to give you a, uh, a sort of live uh, example, uh, yesterday, I, I was uh, shooting a video at the Connaught Hotel in, in London at the world's best bar, which is which is inside this particular hotel. Mm -hmm. And it was a three to, hour, three to four hour video shoot. And the head mixologist at this particular bar designed a cocktail based on my book. Yeah, cool. And for me, that was a bit of creative energy in action because I, I, I'm looking at the people I know and I'm thinking, well, how can I draw on the success they've had? How can I draw on the way they think and blend it with how I think and blend it with what I'm doing? So that's one example. Or another one is that I've got a friend who is a film director and I love films. And so we were talking about how do I market a book uh, to create something that is more experiential? And so we talked about the idea of a trailer. Now, when you go to a cinema and before the film comes on, you have a series of trailers and the trailer is only about one minute, two minutes long. Sure. But if the trailer has done its job, you are going to say to yourself, I want to come back to the cinema and watch that film when it's out. Yes. And so exactly. what I wanted to do by learning from him is to design a book trailer, a trailer yeah. for the book that instead of coming soon to a cinema near you, it is coming soon to a bookstore near you. So okay. to create that emotion and again, thinking a little creatively. Yes. Yeah, that, that, I think that that's a that's a that's a great idea. In fact, I work because I, uh, you know, put together like based on my book, the positive leader, the course, positive mm -hmm. leader, and the guy who is putting the stuff together is the guy who is you know working for Robin Sharma. He's Slovakian, <laughs> and, you know, Michal Kiselica is his name. So he's putting all the stuff together, and he's fantastic professional. Mm -hmm. He knows exactly what to do. So he did the trailer for the course. <laughs> amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing. It is, I think it is a good to partner with some mm. smart, you know, people because you always think, like, especially if you are Microsoft president, you may think, hey, I mm. eat all I ate all smartness of the world. <laughs> 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 and it's not like that. You know? like that. There, is a, there is a one thing you may you know react. Lukash is not having Lukash Kuchavik is not having question, but I want to share something. I love Dr. Joe Dispenza work. His uh, his meditation and techniques are one of the best things that happened to my life. I think Joe Dispenza is. I, I mean, I know him. I did some trainings. Yeah. It's a, it's really good. It's a good stuff, you know. Yeah, I, I think his work is is, is fantastic. In fact, uh, in the introduction of my book, uh, I draw on one of Dr. Joe Dispenza's quote. Uh, which, which talks about the fact uh, that energy is really much about where the game is. You know, when we start to transform our energetic field, which is 
the the charges that surround us that is when we begin to shift shape and transform reality into one that is more aligned to who we are uh that you know i'll finish it. friend tonight it's like shoot for Ian, even if you miss you <laughs> and simon stunning evening thank you a lot hey by the way <laughs> i like that i like that you, you have know. to find that the new quote yeah and shoot yes. for Jan. No, no, no. <laughs> by the way i think lisa and simon they are on the same level like me i just have a couple of more wrinkles here you know this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is the only difference they are you know as smart as me maybe even you know more but i like the saying yeah that you ate all the intelligence that this is not a saying i've ever heard of before but i love it <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make sure we have only five minutes of our time left. It's so short. If anybody has any other questions Absolutely. for Simon and Simon, I have a question for you. Um, we talked a little bit about what really started you wanting to write this mm. book. You found your purpose. You wanted to share with the world. You had your own experience and your mm. own sort of coming to light moment. What's the one big takeaway for anybody who's listening here today? What's the one big thing if you could say, just one key advice or message or thing they should work on or know. What is that? I, I would say a, a key message, and I would wrap this message up in a question for, for you to reflect on. And I was reminded of this message when I became a parent for the first time. And that happened in April 2020. Now, just to paint the scene, in April 2020, the world went, much of the world went into lockdown. Yeah. And so I became a parent for the first time a few days after we could not go outside here in the UK. And so while I could be at the birth of my child, because of guidelines at the time, as a partner, I was only allowed in the recovery ward for one hour after mm -hmm. our child was born. Mm -hmm. And then the staff had to usher all of the partners outside of the hospital so they could manage uh, foot traffic around, yeah. around the ward. Now, the very moment that I held our daughter in my arms for the very first time, as you can imagine, firstly, I was flushed with emotion. I was flushed with love through my entire body. But secondly, I was reminded of something that we so easily forget in the business of our everyday life. And that is the fact that you and I are a miracle. The fact that we have got this opportunity to experience the gift of life in all of its flavors, colors and spectrum of emotions is an absolute blessing. In fact, we have won the greatest lottery ticket there is going, the lottery of life. And so the question that I want to leave the listeners with is what are you going to do with that winning ticket of yours? Amazing. And Simon, if we want to get your book, it's always good for us to pre-order your book, right? I've already got mine on pre-order, <laughs> but it's going to it's going to go guys, live. I, I, I need it because I have a dog here. <laughs> and my wife and my daughter, they came and they were looking for the dog, you know, right? So the dog is here. That's why I disappeared. Anyway. But no, I listen. Don't worry. Yes. I, I, well, <laughs> Simon had this great question. You, you, The miracle of you exists mm. now. What are you going to do with that miracle? How are you going to make mm. it so impactful in the rest of the world and shine your bright light? And when you're 85, how are you going to look back and go, holy, that was an amazing life that I led for me. Not to the look, expectations definitely. of others. Well, look, guys, for me, I was studying for many, many years what is happiness. And, you know, mm -hmm. I thought first it's, you know, money, results, whatever. That's gone. It was like 30 years ago, right? <laughs> and I thought, well, happiness, it's like when I will laugh very much the process, the way what mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. And it's the halfway through. I think really happy people are those mm -hmm. who can make other people happy through some activity they love. Mm. They have a huge yeah. emotion. They are, they, are, they are living their meaning, and their meaning mm. is helping other people and making them happy, you know. And this mm. is it, you know, right? And in, in a nutshell, like, three of us, because we are, like, you know, authors and, you know, coaches and, and mentors and so on, we really try to help other people to understand who they are so mm. they can figure out who they can be. You know what mm. I mean, right? Exactly. But you need as Simon said, you need to understand, you need to have a high self-awareness to figure out where you can go. Otherwise, it's like Alice in the Wonderland. Like, if you don't know where you are, you cannot figure out where you go, you know, right? Mm. This is it. So that's, that's how it. I would, you know, shape it up. That's mm. it. So everybody, go out, buy Simon's book, exactly. pre-order it. It's called, it's getenergizedbook.com. 
Uh, Correct. Get energizedbook.com. We, 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 energized we will put it in the link. I, if you send me a link, I will put it in the link in the YouTube and also on LinkedIn. Great. It's in I have, a couple, of, I have a couple of more questions for Simon. Is it available on Kindle? Correct. It is available on the Kindle, paperback, and audiobook. Oh, so it's audible, audible, you know, right? Yeah, audible, audible. Well. So if you audible. if you download Audible, you will get to hear me speaking directly into your ears for wow, seven hours. Tomorrow, <laughs> so yeah. while we're when jogging, is it, when, and... is when is it available? When is it available? <laughs> tomorrow? No. April yeah, so 21st. it's it's uh it's Next you week, can pre-order it now, and it is officially published on the twenty first of April. So exactly Listen. a week today. Simon, now I listen. I still have like 10 hours to go. I listen, Michael Jordan, and that's mm -hmm. the same level like Simon Alexander Onk, you know, right? So I will, I will continue with you. That's the same level. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and yes. gentlemen, thank you very much thank for being you. with us. Thanks to Lisa and Simon. I think it was a great discussion. You know, it's uh, we have a second book already right here, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. Amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. So we, we need to continue. Thanks very much. And for sure, you will be more than welcome. You know, after some time, we will reflect how is it, you know, uh, going on. And and have a great Eastern, uh, you know, uh, uh, Eastern break. And yeah, looking forward yes. to be back again in two weeks, you know, absolutely. It Yes. So Jan and I will be back together in two weeks. Simon, next weekend, I'll be reading, you know, everybody will be reading your <laughs> book once it's launched. I got the pre-read copy, so I've already read it. I can tell everyone it's great. I, have, for Leo, I, have Simon I, can, in fact, yes, I can put yes, it on my on my, at, uh, on my Kindle. The, the but PDF. you know how you'll spend your Easter, Jan. Thanks, exactly. everyone, for joining. Thank you very much. Have a I great like one. Days. Take care. Bye.